Hi, this is Steve Bainbridge, and I'm back with another ProfessorBainbridge.com video. And this time I thought I'd talk to you about poison pills. They've been in the news a lot lately because last week, Tesla CEO Elon Musk uh, made a tender offer to buy Twitter. And in response, Twitter's board of directors adopted what's known as a poison pill. And I thought it might be worth talking a little bit about what poison pills are and how they work. I'm also planning another video on the legality uh, of poison pills. And I've got a lot more information about poison pills that's available in my book, Mergers and Acquisitions, which you can buy at Amazon. Now, Elon Musk made what's known as a tender offer. Uh, to the shareholders of Twitter to buy the stock that he doesn't already own. And the way a tender offer works is the offeror or bidder, uh, and here, of course, that's Elon, uh, extends a public offer to the shareholders of what's called the target company. And here that would be Twitter and offers to buy some amount of the stock directly from the shareholders. The tender offer is a useful acquisition technique because it allows a buyer to bypass the board of directors of the target company. You can't, for example, do a merger with a target company unless the target's incumbent board of directors approves that merger. But a tender offer lets you bypass the board and go directly to the shareholders and buy the stock from them. And if it succeeds, you end up as the largest shareholder and you can vote the incumbent board of directors out of office and replace them with directors of your own choosing. And so it's a very potent acquisition technique, especially for what are known as hostile takeovers. That is a, uh, attempted acquisition of a corporation where the target board and typically the target management uh, is opposed to the acquisition. Now, about, oh gosh, almost 40 years ago now, uh, there was a very famous takeover lawyer named Martin Lipton. And Martin Lipton and his associates at the Wachtell Lipton firm developed what was known as the poison pill. And the poison pill was a takeover defense that was designed to discourage a bidder from going forward with um, a tender offer without the board of directors approval. And the way it would work would be that the poison pill would put up certain obstacles in the buyer's way um, that the buyer would be unwilling to go forward with the offer unless those obstacles were removed. And the only people who could remove those obstacles would be the target board of directors. So it was designed to prevent a bidder from going forward unless the target board consented. Now, poison pills have two critical components. The first of which is known as a flip over element. And what the flip over element does is to permit the target company shareholders to purchase shares of the acquiring company at a deeply discounted price uh, if the hostile, hostile takeover attempt is successful. And so the target shareholder might, for example, get the right to buy stock in the acquiring company at a two for one rate. And as we'll see, that would have the effect of substantially diluting the equity in the acquiring company. The other type of provision that we see in poison pills is what's known as a flip in pill. And this kicks in where um, uh, the target shareholders are allowed to purchase additional target shares at a steep discount. And that again dilutes the number of shares, although in this case, 
It's diluting the number of acquiring shares. And because the offer is discriminatory in that the acquiring person, that would be Elon Musk in this case, um, because that uh, acquiring person is not allowed to participate in the flip-in option, it's only open to the other shareholders of the company, the impact of a flip-in pill is to significantly dilute the position of uh, the acquiring person in the target company, reducing its proportionate voting power and also substantially reducing the value of the shares that it owns. Now, how does this work? The example that I'm going to use is uh, a fairly typical pill that was adopted, um, oh gosh, back in about 2010, I think, uh, by Netflix. But the technology in this area hasn't really changed all that much because, well, pills work. Uh, and yeah, there have been some refinements here and there, um, but basically pills today work exactly the same way they did 10 years ago. So the Netflix pill is still a good example. Now, the way the Netflix pill worked was that the company issued what were known as rights. Rights are a form of corporate security that are kind of like an option um, or a warrant, if you're familiar with that concept. Basically, what a right does is to give the holder the right uh, to surrender the right to the company along with some money and in return for which they would receive stock of the issuing company. Now, in Netflix's case, what they did was to issue one right per share of common stock. So if you owned 100 shares of Netflix stock, you got 100 rights. Now, initially, the rights are what they called stapled. Uh, they were attached to the common stock and they didn't trade separately uh, from the common stock. So if you sold a share of Netflix common stock, the right went with it. And the rights were priced in a way that you wouldn't want to exercise them. Uh, initially, each right was convertible uh, into one one thousandth of a share of preferred Netflix stock. Um, in other words, you would get 0.1% of a share for every right you surrendered. And you would have to pay $350 for each tenth of a percent of a preferred share. And the preferred share um, uh, would have very minimal rights uh, and basically, it was an unattractive option. The preferred shares that you would get would be worth much less than what you would have to pay for them. Um, and so the anticipation was that nobody would exercise the rights at this stage of the process. Well, why would Netflix have done that? And the reason has to do with a specific provision of the Delaware General Corporation Law, which is section 157. And what section 157 says is that it authorizes rights that entitle the holders thereof to purchase from the corporation any shares of stock. And one of the things that the early drafters of Poison Pills, namely Marty Lipton and his colleagues, one of the arguments that they anticipated people would make against the validity of these pills was that the rights were a sham security. So they made a right that was designed to be a real right that you could in theory exercise. It's just nobody would want to. So they were anticipating precisely the sham security argument and they had drafted the right in a way that would enable them to rebut that. Now, 
the Netflix pill then starts out as rights stapled to the common stock, issued as a dividend on the common stock, and convertible into a fraction of a share of preferred stock. Now, the pill had <clears throat> now the pill had a ten percent trigger. The triggering point has been controversial. When the poison pill was first invented, they typically had a 20% trigger. That is to say the pill activated only after a bidder uh, or in the Netflix pill, it's called the acquiring person. But only after the acquiring person bought 20% or more of the stock would the pill trigger. And over time, takeover defense lawyers pushed the threshold down. And today, the Netflix pill is pretty typical. It has a 10% trigger. So if someone acquires 10% or more uh, of uh, Netflix common stock, then the flip over element would kick into play. Um, and so uh, what happens then? when somebody triggers the pill by buying 10% or more. Well, what happens next depends on what that acquiring person does next. If after triggering the pill, the acquiring person attempts to do a merger with the target company or attempts to buy uh, all or substantially all of the target company's uh, assets, well, then the flip over provision kicks in. And what the flip over provision gives is the right for the holders of the right. Now, instead of purchasing this fraction of a Netflix share of preferred stock, the acquiring, or excuse me, the target company shareholders now would have the right to flip the right over and buy shares of stock in the acquiring company at a very significant discount to market, typically 50%. That's uh, what happens here with the Netflix bill, that Netflix shareholders would be able to buy $200 worth of common stock for $100. Now, what would happen in the Twitter case? Suppose, for example, Elon Musk, the individual, is the acquiring person. Suppose it's Elon Musk that buys the 10% and holds it in his individual capacity. Obviously, the Twitter shareholders can't buy shares of stock in Elon Musk. Same problem might come up if Elon formed a partnership or a limited liability company, or if he formed a corporation that didn't have enough authorized stock to meet the demands of the Twitter shareholders exercising their flip over rights. Well, if he tried to go forward with a transaction, Well, what happens next depends on what the acquiring person does next. If the acquiring person tries to do a merger with the target company or tries to buy all or substantially all uh, of the target company's assets, um, then the target shareholders get the right, the option, but it flips over into a right to acquire acquiring company shares. So if Corporation A becomes an acquiring person by buying 10% of the target company stock, the shareholders of the target company would have the right in the event of a merger or asset sale now to buy stock in the acquiring company at a significant discount. So what's the effect of a flip over pill on an acquiring corporation? 
Well, this is a very simplified example, but let's start off by assuming that the acquiring company has assets of $1,000 uh, before becoming an acquiring person. Then they have 100 shares of stock outstanding. And um, their stock price is $10 a share. Um, the pill becomes exercisable, uh, and the acquiring person attempts to do a merger with the target. The flip over right then kicks in. And so the target shareholders come to the acquiring person and say, we have a contractual right that you have to sell us 100 shares of stock at $5 a share at a 50% discount to the market price. Well, what's going to happen to the acquirer if that happens? Well, the acquirer would then have net assets of $1,500. They started out with net assets of 1,000 and they're going to get $500, $5 a share when they issue the 100 shares pursuant to the poison pill. So net assets will go up to 1,500. But now there'll be 200 shares of acquiring stock outstanding. And the stock would drop to $7.50. Again, I'm really simplifying here. I'm assuming that the stock price is equal to the net asset value per share, which it almost never is. By the way, if you're on my YouTube channel, I've got videos on how companies are valued uh, in the takeover setting, valued for legal purposes. And I encourage you to watch them. And we'll get into the kind of, you know, the actual numbers in those videos here, I'm just trying to keep it very simple. Well, what's the effect of that? Well, the target shareholders um, make money. If I exercise my right, I now got a share of target stock plus a share of acquiring company stock that's a net of 250. I paid $5 for it, but it's now worth 750. This dilutes the value and the voting rights of the acquiring company's pre-existing shareholders. And perhaps most importantly, from the acquiring company's management perspective, uh, it's going to put the management of the acquiring company's stock options underwater. Uh, by reducing the value of the stock, it makes those stock options a lot less valuable. And as we know, the vast bulk of what public corporation managers get paid these days, especially at the C-suite level, chief executive officer, chief operating officer, and so on. At that level, most of their pay comes in the form of stock options or restricted stock, the value of which would drop significantly. In addition to which, um, the exercise of the flip over uh, right um, may violate financial covenants in the acquiring companies, bond indentures, bank debt agreements, uh, and other contracts. Um, and so the net effect is, is that there would be a significant financial detriment uh, to going forward with a merger in the face of a flip over poison pill. Um, and so uh, the idea was, and it turned out to be correct, that that would deter acquiring companies from going forward with a merger uh, once the poison pill had triggered. Now, you say, well, what happens then if, say, the acquiring company doesn't have enough stock? Couldn't they get around it that way? Well, no. Um, if the acquiring company is, for whatever reason, unable to issue shares to the target stockholders that exercise their rights, well, then those shareholders are entitled to an injunction forbidding the acquiring company from going forward with a merger. Now, at that point, you may be saying to yourself, how can this be legal? And there are essentially two issues that we want to think about there. One of which is the fiduciary duties of the target directors who adopt the poison pill. And that's going to be the subject of my next video. What I want to explain today, though, is how can it be legal for a target company 
to give its shareholders the right to buy stock in somebody else. I mean, after all, you're creating a right for your shareholders to go over to an entirely separate, entirely different company and force that other company to sell your shareholders stock of that company. How can that work? And the genius of the folks who invented the poison pill was to recognize that there was a precedent. And here, what I mean by precedent is not a prior legal decision, but rather an example. And the example that they seized on came from convertible securities. Convertible securities might be a convertible bond, debenture, or preferred stock. And here, uh, the example I'm using comes from convertible preferred. The idea behind convertible preferred is that you buy preferred stock and typically preferred stock that's sold in a uh, commercial finance setting uh, carries a dividend so that you buy the preferred stock so that every month, quarter, year, uh, whatever the terms are, uh, you get a dividend check in the mail so that you get income. Um, the convertible feature, uh, if the preferred stock has one, gives the holder of the preferred stock the right to buy shares of the issuer's common stock. So let's say the preferred stock uh, has a conversion price of $10 uh, per share so that you could exchange the preferred stock for $10 worth of common stock. At the time that preferred stock was issued, it would have been issued out of the money. So, you know, the common stock might be worth $8. Well, you wouldn't trade in preferred stock for common stock if you would have to give up something worth $10 to get something that's only worth eight. On the other hand, if the common stock rose above the exercise price, if the common stock went up to say $15, well, then you could give them your preferred stock and give them $10 and they would give you common stock that was worth 15. Now, the problem with the conversion feature is what happens if the company that issued it merges with another company? say issuer sold you the convertible preferred and now issue is going to be bought by Acme and they're going to merge with the surviving company being Acme. Well, your preferred stock gives you a right to swap that preferred stock for common stock of the issuer. It doesn't give you, automatically at least, it doesn't give you the right to trade it in for stock of Acme. And so a merger could destroy the value of the conversion feature. And part of what you paid for when you bought a convertible security is in effect a gamble. In effect, you're buying a share of preferred stock and a lottery ticket. And the lottery pays off if the value of the underlying common goes up above the conversion price. But if they do this merger, they're taking away your lottery ticket and not giving you anything for it. So why would you buy preferred stock? Well, in order to get around that problem, lawyers came up with what were known as anti-destruction clauses. And the anti-destruction clause basically um, works in a variety of ways, but this one is fairly typical. Um, and essentially what it does is to require the acquiring company to give them the same merger consideration that they would have received um, if they had converted uh, immediately before the merger. In effect, what it says is um, you get shares of stock of the acquiring company. 
And that's a fairly typical anti-destruction provision. And that's exactly the analogy that they seized on when they came up with the poison pill. Now, one of the critical things about a flip over uh, pill is that it's discriminatory. It cannot be exercised uh, by the acquiring person uh, or any of its affiliates and certain persons to whom it might have sold stock of the target company. So suppose Elon Musk sets up a company and he triggers the Twitter poison pill by buying more than 10% of the stock of Twitter. And then he proposes to do a merger with Twitter such that the rights, the flip over rights become exercisable. And all the Twitter shareholders want to now exercise these rights. What the discrimination provision does is to say that the rights that were attached to the stock that Elon owns become null and void, as do the rights attached to shares held by Elon's affiliates, people that are working in collaboration with him. So that only true Twitter shareholders get to buy the stock. Okay, so that's the flip over provision. Now let's talk about the flip in provision. Again, the rights are triggered to the common stock. It's all the same right after all. Um, and again, the flip in provision is triggered when somebody buys 10% or more uh, of Netflix stock. Again, the flip in aspect is discriminatory. The rights are null and void once somebody acquires 10% or more uh, of Twitter's common stock. The flip in element, however, says, suppose Elon Musk Inc. triggered the pill by buying more than 10%. And suppose Elon never proposes a merger. He just goes on buying stock until he gets 50%, at which point he would own enough stock to have control of the company. He could vote out the board of directors and vote in a new board. That's exactly, by the way, what happened in one of the very first poison pill cases uh, involving a company called Crown Zellerback. And a buyer named Sir James Goldsmith triggered the Crown Zellerback pill, but he never proposed a merger. He just kept buying Crown Zellerback stock until he had 50 plus percent voted out the Crown Zellerback board and went about his business. Meanwhile, if anybody else had tried to merge with Crown Zellerback, they would have faced the poison of the poison pill. So the flip over provision had that weakness. As long as the acquiring person was willing not to do a merger, but simply to hold stock, it didn't have any deterrent effect. So Marty Lipton put his thinking cap on and he said, aha, well, we're going to add to the poison pill a flip in provision. And what the flip in provision will do is to allow target shareholders to acquire stock of the target company at a significant discount. The impact of this is that uh, the holdings of the acquiring person in the target company are massively diluted. In uh, the case in which Grand Met tried to buy the Pillsbury company, um, Grand Met had acquired 85% of Pillsbury stock. And if the poison pill had kicked in, it would have diluted Grand Met's position from 85% to 56%. And the value of Grand Met's holdings of Pillsbury stock would have declined by more than $700 million. And so basically there again, 
the fact that your holding would be massively diluted uh, as a result of the flip-in provision uh, is expected to act as a deterrent uh, from a bidder going forward. Now, most acquisitions are friendly deals. Most acquisitions don't involve the sort of hostile reaction that Twitter's, uh, so far at least, uh, showing to Elon Musk's bid. So what do you do if you're a target company and you've got a poison pill in place and somebody comes along and makes you an offer that you want to accept? How do you get around that problem? Well, all pills have a redemption provision in them that give the board of directors of the target company the right to redeem the rights, to repurchase the rights, which would have the effect of uh, rending them null and void at a very nominal cost. In the Netflix case, the rights were redeemable uh, for um, a tenth of a penny per right. After the, as I mentioned earlier, most companies use a triggering uh, level of no less than 10%. Um, and the only real exception to that has been what are known as net operating loss pills or NOL pills. And these were very much in fashion in the wake of the financial crisis back in 2008, where a lot of companies had generated a lot of losses. Now, under the Internal Revenue Code, certain operating losses can be carried over to future years so that if you lose money in this year, you get a deduction um, that you can use to reduce your income. But if you ended up with a net loss for that year, you're not gonna have any taxable income. So you can carry that operating loss over to a future year in which you were profitable and use the NOL to reduce your tax burden in that future year. So NOLs are very valuable for companies that go through financial difficulty, but then emerge on the other side as a profitable company. And as I say, there was a lot of that uh, in the 2008 financial crisis. We also saw um, some companies revisiting this during the uh, height of the pandemic, uh, right when the COVID-19 pandemic started and they were anticipating big operating losses in 2020. The Internal Revenue Code basically says that the amount of your NOLs that can be carried over is limited. If one of your shareholders who owns 5% or more of your stock increases its holdings by 50% or more, I don't get this provision. I don't understand what it's supposed to do. I've asked tax lawyers, and tax lawyers tend to be a pretty um, haughty bunch of folks. They think that working with the code requires superior intelligence. Now, some of my best friends are tax lawyers, but even they would say, Steve, you're a corporate lawyer. You just, you can't understand the code. Just take it as is. Fine whatever. In any event, we corporate lawyers, our tax lawyer friends came running to us and said, oh, our clients have all these NOLs. Help us, help us, help us, because people are going to come along and they're going to buy more stock and we're not going to be able to carry over our NOLs. We we're like, fine. So we invented the NOL pill. And basically what the NOL pill has is a very low threshold. Um, it's typically 4.9%. The idea here being, you don't have to worry about a shareholder owning 5% or more and then increasing their ownership level by 50% if they never get above 5%. So if we can keep them all below 4.9, then we don't have to worry about this. 
Um, while the NO, NOL pill had this very low triggering threshold, um, there were a number of differences uh, with um, these pills as compared to the more traditional pills. Um, for example, the board had the power to exempt specific shareholder transactions without having to redeem the entire pill. Um, in addition, um, the NOL pills were not designed to prevent a merger. So they were uh, typically flip in only. Um, they didn't have flip over provisions because the idea here is we're not trying to prevent a merger. What we're trying to do is to prevent an existing shareholder from increasing the amount of stock that they own. Okay. Well, what impact does the poison pill have on shareholders? And that's an important question because generally speaking, the shareholders don't have a voice in whether or not a poison pill gets adopted. They don't have a voice in whether it gets triggered. And so, you know, what's the impact that a poison pill is going to have on those shareholders? Well, typically a poison pill has had a negative, a slight negative impact uh, on uh, the price of the stock of the company that adopts it. Economists measure uh, the impact of events by looking at something called cumulative abnormal returns. And I talk about those in my videos on uh, valuation, which you can, again, you can get those at the professormainbridge.com channel here on YouTube. Um, interestingly enough, however, pills that are adopted in response to a specific takeover bid um, often result in positive cumulative abnormal returns on the order of three to 4%. Um, and the reason for that probably is that at least in the old days, um, when a company adopted a poison pill, it was because they were scared of getting taken over. And shareholders would view the adoption of a poison pill as a signal that somebody would end up buying the company. And most of the time when people buy companies, they pay what's known as a control premium. They pay a price that's higher than the market price. What's interesting about the Twitter case is Twitter stock actually went down, which would suggest that the Twitter shareholders don't really expect anybody to end up buying Twitter, which would be my guess too. Now, companies that adopted a pill and then got sold um, ended up getting a fairly substantial premium. The control premium that was paid for those companies was on average 24% higher than the control premium paid for companies that didn't have a poison pill. Now, how do we explain all this? Well, the slight negative impact probably is because the market recognizes that poison pills deter takeovers. And takeovers are generally good for shareholders because again, they get this control premium. The stock price rise where a pill is adopted in response to a specific takeover bid um, is probably, uh, again, as I suggested, a result of a recognition by the market that the company's in play. Finally, the fact that holders of a class of, uh, holders of a poison pill rather get a higher than average premium suggests that managers are either being successful in using the pill to negotiate higher prices from the initial bidder, or they're delaying the initial bidder while they go out and find another bidder who would be willing to come in and offer a higher price. Well, do poison pills work? And the answer to that is yes. They work really well. Numerous sources have uh, confirmed that nobody has ever triggered a rights-based poison pill. 
a bitter face with a rights-based poison pill has either gone away, persuaded the board to redeem the pill, or conducted a successful proxy contest to replace the board and had the new board that was then elected redeem the pill. And this last option gave rise to what may be the most effective takeover defense of all time, which is to couple the poison pill with what's known as a classified board of directors or a staggered board of directors. Most boards of directors are elected annually. All of the directors are up for election every year. But in a classified board, you divide the board into two or three classes. And in each year, only one class is up for election kind of like the way the Senate of the United States works. In year one, class one is up for election. And that class, when elected, will serve a three-year term. In year two, class two is up for election. And if re-elected, class two will serve a three-year term. Year three, class three is up for election. And if reelected, will serve a three-year term. Class one, however, was not up for re-election in years two or three. They were serving out their three-year term. Class one will only come up for re-election in year four. Now, if you think about it, what a classified board means is that if you want to take control of the board of directors, if you want to elect a majority of the board of directors, you have to win two successive proxy contests. Year one, you would have elected a third of the board. Year two, you would have elected another third. You'd have two thirds, you'd have a majority. But it's gonna take you two annual meeting cycles to elect a majority of the board. And since you need a majority of the board to redeem the poison pill, you're going to have to win two consecutive elections to redeem the pill. And that's really hard. Number one, it's a long time for a buyer to sit around waiting to get control. You've invested a lot of money in this company, and you're taking a lot of risks by sitting around for two election cycles, maybe as much as two years before you get control. You're incurring costs all the while, not least of which is your opportunity costs of not being able to go forward with the deal or going on with some other deal. So it's a very effective combination. All right. Well, I hope that shed some light on recent events, helps you understand what's going on with Twitter and Elon Musk a little better. As I say, my next video, hopefully I'm going to record that one tomorrow. But my next video will deal with the legality of poison pills. Focus obviously on Delaware corporate law because in the world of corporate law, Delaware is the 800 pound gorilla. All right, thank you very much. If you enjoyed this video, please like and consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you very much. See you next time.